Hi, this is Justin Paperni back with another White Collar 101 video, and today we're going to talk about our top 10 checklist before surrendering to federal prison. I didn't have this checklist before I surrendered to Taft Federal Prison Camp in April of 2008. Uh, as many of you might know if you've read my book, Lessons from Prison, I wasn't really that willing to prepare. I was living in denial, and rather than preparing or going through a valuable checklist, I was uh, gorging myself at a, you know, restaurants like Tito's Tacos, which is a landmark here in Los Angeles. Uh, playing a lot of golf, doing everything but really to prepare for the inevitable, which was that I was going to be surrendering to prison. So I do these videos and I do this work in part because I want people to be better prepared than me because too many defendants go into the prison system uh, totally blind. And hopefully a video like this helps remove some of the anxieties that come with surrendering. And I know the anxiety because I've been there, uh, so I want to help. So let's go to detail number one, uh, surrender details. If you're surrendering to prison, you better make sure that you're ready what do you need? First and foremost, make sure the receiving prison has your pre-sentence investigation. Make sure they have your paperwork. Simply ask your lawyer to call the prison to confirm they have it. If they don't, uh, they can hold you in segregation or the SHU um, until they actually receive it. They have to confirm you're classified in the correct prison, you're designated there, and your paperwork um, will certainly help. So we want to make sure they have your paperwork. If your lawyer is non-responsive or unwilling to call, um, then you're going to have to take some matters into your own hand. I can help. I can offer you some advice. But frankly, your lawyer should uh, be willing to make that call, presuming you're in good standing, um, and you ask them to. I don't think it's a huge uh, request, frankly. Now, a couple of other points on the surrender. Get there a few hours early. So if it says 2 o'clock, get there at 11 o'clock um, to ensure you're there before the guards have a shift. Um, you don't have to worry about speeding. There's a lot of tickets that are given in some of these prison towns with cops just waiting, knowing people are going to be getting uh, to the prison. So get there preferably early uh, and make sure they have your paperwork and money. I'll put up an address here. Do not surrender with money. You want to either send it to Western Union or send it to the address in Iowa. Now, Western Union, it will take two to four hours, so you can do it that same day. Um, or if you're going to do it through the regular, you know, mail and send it to the address in Iowa, uh, it'll take just a couple of days. But the goal is to get it on your books as quickly as possible. And quick point to you white collar offenders um, who have restitution. Do not surrender with too much money on your books or else they can take a huge portion of it for restitution. Um, so I know of some you know, white collar offenders in prison who are going to be there for a year. They surrender with $4,000 and a chunk of it is taken, it should be spread out throughout uh, the journey from, from my experience or else they're, think, uh, they're just going to think you're flush and they're going to take more. Number two, finances. The individual who prepares himself well will ensure that his finances um, are in order. That includes a few things. I would get a power of attorney created at something that I didn't do and there was some uh, maneuvering I had to do from the inside with the notary and they weren't there and when I got there they left early. It was just a total nightmare trying to maneuver this from prison. So I would get a power of attorney completed. Um, for some of you that have brokerage accounts and IRAs, they're going to fire you. It is an all likelihood that you're going to get fired. As I articulated in Lessons from Prison, uh, I was working with Merrill Lynch six days after I surrendered to prison. They learned that I was in prison. Apparently they get some sort of run from the FBI. No notification, they froze my account, and I lost a lot of money. So prior to your surrender to prison, even if you have a long-lasting relationship with a brokerage firm or a bank, you can expect that at some point they're going to fire you. So I have some contacts that might be able to help you if you have a felony conviction. You might have to leverage off a relationship, but it's an inconvenience to use all of your phone minutes from prison trying to find a new bank or trying to convince them to hold off on liquidating your assets until you are released from prison. Further to budgeting, think about uh, what it, it's going to cost you to live in prison. I have clients that spend $100 a month, some that are writing books and spend $1,000 a month, and everything in between. But if you can budget for this now or have an idea of what it's going to cost you, you can make better decisions. My advice, start off at a number that can only move higher. In other words, don't start off at you know 300 and then you're down to 200 because you're going to go grow used to a standard of living. Start at 200 and if things improve, you're working or finances improve and you can go to 300, great. But I'd go low and try to move uh, a little bit higher. But have a budget in mind, stick to it to the extent that you can. Avoid the hustle, having money go to other inmates' books. I'm pretty much against that because it makes it harder on those who suffer the most, namely our family. I think we've inconvenienced them 
enough. So some do it. I'm generally against it. You have to make your own. Uh, you have to make your own decisions. Let's transition down to number three, reading. You're gonna have a lot of time, and you're gonna have a lot of time in federal prison. Okay, and reading is a wonderful way to spend your time. I read more than a hundred books in prison, and I have a lot of them here in my my home office. So before you surrender to prison, you should be on Amazon. You should be forming a wish list. You should be sharing that list with your with your family. You should be letting them know the types of books that you are reading are going to translate to some of the problems you're going to face upon your release. So I remember one time in prison, I was reading a John Grisham book and Michael Santos politely said to me, you might as well be watching the movie. And I said, well, I'm reading a book. He said, yeah, you might as well be watching the movie. What are you learning from that? What's the educational value in that? And it was a really great point. So from there on out, I only read books that related to the life I wanted to lead upon release, namely as a consultant, speaking about ethics, white collar crime, and the consequences that follow bad decisions. So establish a reading list. It will help carry you through your journey. And it's a wonderful way to connect with family during visita visitation. I remember reading books um, alongside friends and they'd visit and we would discuss it. I remember a close friend of mine said, dude, I haven't you know, read this, read this many books in a long, long time, but it's something to do together. It's kind of fun, and I'm really enjoying it. And it gave us a great discussion uh, over visitation. Admittedly, some of the books I suggested to friends, uh, like some philosophy and ethics books, uh, they threw out. They have no interest in reading. The only value they said was curing insomnia. So my ethics uh, is not for everyone, but still create that book list and share it with your network before you go in because they're going to want to know how they can help. Can they send you money? Can they send you books? Um, and you should also work on a going away uh, letter that advises them on how many phone minutes you have, what visitation is like, um, how they can send you books. No, they can't send you cookies and your favorite pillows. I think you have an obligation to alert those who have stood by you on what you can and cannot do. That's why I'm a big uh, proponent of writing a, a going away letter that walks them through some of the nuances of email, phone, etc. Uh, journaling, I think reading is fantastic, but it's sort of a passive activity, right? Sit back, you can read for 10, 12 hours a day in prison. You want to continue to increase your skill set. So come up with a with a Google, excuse me, with a journaling plan. Even, you know, right now, if you were to Google you know, Michael Santos, he wrote more than 20 books in prison. He helped me write my book from prison. So reading is a great activity, but you want to transition it either to blogging, writing a book, or even if you don't want to write a blog, you still want to be writing about your experience and distributing it through the email system to your network. I cannot stress that enough. So if blogging isn't for you, you have to be letting your network know the steps that you're putting in place to prepare for a law-abiding life upon release. So it can be weekly, it can be bi-weekly, articulate your goals, your classes you're enrolled in, steps that you're taking to prepare for release. That journaling should also include a letter to your probation officer that all of my clients do. So even now, as you're preparing to go in, I understand the stress and the anxiety. You're getting your medications in order. You're making sure you have the prescriptions. You are spending time with your family. You are getting your finances in order. In addition, you got to think about a journaling plan. And you got to think about getting a job in the halfway house. And it's tough to get a job in the halfway house when you've been gone for three years and you call your buddy and say, hey, bud, I just got out of jail. Can you hire me? Wouldn't it be easy if you were nurturing that process along the way? I think so. It's like that old cliche. Uh, when you ask a, a woman out for a when you meet a woman for the first time, you don't say, will you marry me? It's a little odd. Would you like to have a cup of coffee? Yes. Would you like to have another cup of coffee? Yes. Another cup of coffee? Yes. And eventually you might get married. Well, it's the same thing here. You've got to nurture these relationships from prison and journaling and documenting the journey, whether through a blog or privately amongst your network is a really incredible way to do that. So think about what you're going to read and really think about what you're going to write. Personal belongings. If reading glasses are necessary, bring two pairs of reading glasses on the day of your surrender. Choose an expensive, sturdy glasses. The BOP commissary will also sell reading glasses. So if you have prescriptions, uh, prescription glasses, simply bring them, uh, bring them with you. You'll have a, a better chance of getting them in, of course. Also, some prisons like Lewisburg, I've had some clients uh, who got in with a pair of white shoes and a watch. What did they do? Well, we checked the commissary list. We saw the watch they sold, had an idea of the type of shoes, and they were willing to invest 50 or 60 bucks in a watch and shoes with the hope that they'll get in, and they were able to. I, on the other hand, was not. I went in with my shoes, my watch, the whole thing. Uh, they took it. I felt like I had been artfully robbed. Uh, it was a learning lesson. I had no chance of getting it in, but some prisons will actually let you bring in a watch and some shoes. At the end of the day, it might be unlikely 
you just have to be prepared to, to roll the dice if you're willing to spend uh, the money. So personal belongings, you can wear a wedding ring if you like, presuming it doesn't have a, an apparent value of more than $100. Uh, your glasses, you can try to do the shoes and the watch. Uh, you can bring yourself your contact list. You can add up to 100 emails through CoreLink. Uh, you could also mail it to yourself the, the day of your surrender. You can bring a Bible, of course. So start to think about the personal belongings, your ID. If someone goes in with you, you can show them your ID and give it back to your friend or family member who walked it in, or they can hold on to it and keep it in your file, but you want that ID to confirm that, um, you know, that you're there naturally. So let's continue to transition down this list. Communication preparation, okay? Unfortunately, the federal prison system only allows 300 phone minutes a month. 400 in November and December, less than 10 minutes a day. It's totally inadequate. I think it's a shame, frankly. I think it's, uh, I think it's tragic that they expect you to reconnect with your community and family on less than 10 minutes a day. With that said, you've got to be, be prepared to uh, have a phone list. Um, that way you can, I believe you can add up to 30 names on that list. You can change the list if necessary. Keep in mind, phone calls home are recorded. If you're going to roll the dice and try to run a business, it has to be done ethically in the right way. Other inmates could be listening and turn you in. There's a lot of that prison gossip taking place. So phone calls are recorded. You only have 300 phone minutes a month. And if there's something dicey you have to discuss about a business, my suggestion is waiting um, until you have a visit to discuss it in person. It's easier than trying to roll the dice and uh, say it on the phone. I'd encourage you to record your uh, or watch your phone minutes as best you can, time them, because you only get 300 and, um, and they're really precious. So I would manage them wisely. And also set the tone with your friends that you're really gonna be saving those phone minutes for family. Uh, email's different, it still costs five cents a minute, but phone, it's only 300 phone minutes enough. It's just really not enough um, to work with. So. Let's continue. Also, legal contacts. If you have uh, legal contacts, lawyers you're going to be communicating with, that's a separate process you'll go through where you can speak with them outside of your phone minutes. You can visit with them outside of regular visit, uh, visiting hours. So if you have lawyers, um, that's a separate process than the phone minutes. Now, here's a little bit of my ethics shtick and philosophy that Michael Santos really introduced me to that had a huge impact on my life. Values and goals. So before my surrender to prison while I was playing golf and eating Tito's tacos and living in denial, I should have been articulating and establishing my values and goals and sharing them with my network. My family was distraught over my prison term. Um, they were frustrated over the bad decisions that I made. And rather than letting them suffer, I should have continued to or began creating goals and telling them how they could hold me accountable on the way. So what are your goals? Is it fitness? Is it reading, writing, teaching? Is it a book, growing closer with your family, getting a GED? Whatever those goals are, you can do all of them from prison. Again, I'm not insane. Prison, I, I'm not glad that I was there, but it's an incredible opportunity to recalibrate, get it together, and build a better future, to not waste that time. And if you have clearly defined values and goals, it's just much easier to do that. So on this top 10 list, as you get your medication in order, as you have that last meal, get your finances in order, maybe looking for a new broker or bank, articulate those values and goal. Accountability metric. When I used to share my goals with Michael Santos in prison, he'd say, well, how am I going to hold you accountable? And I chose to put it out there for the world to hold me accountable through a blog. But unless people are holding you accountable and you can clearly define what you're after, you'll never know if you're going to get there. And some prisoners like that, they like they don't want, they don't, no one has to hold them accountable. It's easier to say it, have no one judge you, and then if you don't achieve your goal, there's no criticism, there's no feedback. On my end, I liked that accountability. As a baseball player through USC, I liked that I was being watched or judged. It gave me something to work towards. That's just what motivates me. So by articulating my goals and having accountability metrics and um, clearly identified how much I would run or write or read, uh, how many letters I write to my probation officer, it made a big difference. So even now, after you've identified your values, think about how you're going to let others hold you accountable, your mom, dad, brother, sister, somebody in your network has to hold you accountable. That will force you to wake early on days while the dorm sleeps and force you to run when it's cold and snowing or when it's hot, like 112 degrees, like it was at Taft Camp. Some days it was Michael Santos, me and my friend Andrew Alcheck on the, on the, Andrew Alcheck on the track. God rest his soul. He passed away in prison. If you say something, you have to do it. As hard as it might be, it's easier with accountability metrics. The quadrant adjustment is something that 
um, essentially put you into a tier. And this is something that Michael Santos really introduced, introduced me to. There's low risk, low reward activities in prison. There's high risk, high reward activities in prison, low reward, high risk, and vice versa. So as you go through a quadrant, think about what's low reward and, and low low risk. So for example, you know, sleeping all day is low reward. It's, it's also low risk. Playing cards all day can be high reward because you can gamble and win, but it's also high risk. I would argue running and exercising is high reward and really low risk. So think about the quadrant theory um, and where you fall into this. Do you want to be high, high risk, high reward, low risk, high reward, etc. If you can have this, this theory on your mind before you go in, you'll be able to better plan your day. So the quadrant theory played a huge impact on my life, thanks to my buddy Michael Santos. Your release plan, when you surrender, think about the day that you will emerge to find success. And in so doing, you will have a proven process to govern your adjustment. So when you go in, you're going to bring your driver's license and social security card, your case manager in prison will hold it. And having those things with you when you leave and transition to the half house will ease your surrender. So as I close with number 10, the release plan. It's hard to imagine this journey is going to be behind you. I get it. It's hard to imagine that someday you're actually going to be released from prison because so many of you like me have fought your case for so long. It's never ending. It just continues and continues and you wonder if you're ever going to get sentenced and go to prison, but eventually the gates are going to open. You're going to come home. And if you can implement these 10 strategies before you surrender to prison, if you can share your values with your family, if you can articulate what's important to you and have others hold you accountable and get some of the logistics out of the way, the finances, the money, the medication. Um, if you're going for the residential drug abuse program, we're working with us and your counselor to make sure the letter comes in for your interview. If we can get these logistics down, your journey will be much easier than it needs to be. You won't learn any lessons the hard way. And uh, this is a much longer video than I had planned to create, maybe too long, but there's a lot that I wanted wanted to cover. I hope all of you find value in this video. If you'd like a free copy of Lessons from Prison, don't buy it, it's free. Simply go to whitecollar101.com and I'll happily send you a copy along with this top 10 surrender checklist. Thank you all uh, very much for watching. For those of you about to go in, work hard. It can be an incredible experience if you let it. Don't complain. Be thankful and grateful uh, and the time will fly by, I assure you. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye.